Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to Bioshock Infinite. I guess there are people in here. A nice shot. Those really weren't, but well that one was. I like the way I'm electrocuting everyone next to the people I'm actually shooting. <laughs> Unprotected melee guy. Didn't really think those people were still around. I should keep him busy for a while, at least. And what I really want to do is charge into people again. Oh, here we go. Yeah, now that did it. I didn't even have to shoot both of the guys over here. Now they don't really seem to lead into the vault, they seem to lead to a room adjacent to the vault. Which presumably is how one would get in there considering the giant ass door. Fifty percent. What's that? Fifty percent of everything people earn here goes right to Comstock as a tithe. I gotta get me a job in the profit business. Fancy putting those lockpicking skills to work? No problem. Ready. You know, in more reasonable places and times, the usual tithe. You hold on to this. Catch. The usual religious tithe is ten percent. I, I believe. In Islam, one of the pillars is uh, like a 10% charity. Like, if you can afford to give away 10% of your income, then you should. And mostly it's to uh, yeah, religious-based charities. Because the idea is that you are not funding, you know, Islam with it. Well... Actually, depending on which variety of Islam you're talking about, you are. But for the most part, it's intended to be spent on those who cannot afford to give away 10% of their income. Where did my money go? I could have sworn I didn't collect it. Well, that's deceptive. Got a green light up there, but you can't go through the damn door. Oh well. Looks like I could have set up here as a sniper. If I had been so inclined. Instead, I just sort of stood in one corner and half the people just sort of ran straight to me. Anyway, footsteps aimed to the right, so of course, I'm going to go to the left first. You know, you wouldn't expect to find apples and bananas inside sorting catalogs. Grab that lockpick. We might need it later. So... Is the idea that each of those little things is like someone's financial accounts? Is that why there are so many around here? Man, this guy was set up. But yeah, of course. That is not worth it. 
nice painting they've got here. Hmm. I especially love what they've done with the blood. Man, everybody's a hoarder these days. All right, let's see. Type three letters to spell the voice. Three letters. V O X. Try the typewriter. You know, if they killed the guy in this office. I know the prophet is a liar. He cannot be. I know the prophet is a murderer, but he cannot be. For if the future lies only in the imagination of God, why would he reveal it to such a monster? Almost finished with the infusions. Anyway, if they killed the guy who owns that office, then... How would he be a Vox sympathizer? And if he's not a Vox sympathizer, then... How did they know about the secret behind the door? But then again... You know, with, uh... With the Rebellion going entirely crazy at this point... It actually does seem possible that, uh... There's no one in here. Guess I jumped the gun. But now it does seem possible that uh, he was a Vox sympathizer, but the men who came here did not know that. I've thought so. Yeah, there's one of them crow raven dudes. I guess he's just sort of running around here trying to act all scary, even though we fought two of them to get into the bank. He's not especially scary at this point. Annihilating these people now. Having some real fun. But yeah, if you want to know why I figure that there was that contradiction there, is that the guy was secretly a member of the Vox. But the uh, Vox Populi who happened to raid the bank, he either didn't realize that or didn't care. And so they Marcus. killed him. We can always use more of them. Yes, we can, but that's only if they let me pick them up. What the hell? Yeah, I mean we've actively we're actively on the hunt for a ghost here. Why is the game trying to scare me with a damn raven boy? The most cowardly weight raven boy of them all, no less. He's doing the old, uh... slasher movie villain thing, where he just sort of appears and disappears. I mean, at least in this case, there is an actual excuse for how he's able to do that. Because he can teleport using crows. Nah. As it is, it's, it's like a lot of effort to try and make one of the most basic enemies frightening. I don't get that. Uh, 
I guess I'm going to have to face him after I listen to the, uh... Need some help with this. Looks simple enough. After I listen to the... Rift. There. Lotus says the bastard is a creation not of her womb, but of some unholy science. I do not know which is true. The child is no more divine than I. What says that from my husband's prophecy? He begs my silence, but I can only offer him forgiveness. But with repentance need come truth. I can suffer his lies no longer. And so he killed her because she refused to stay silent. But we've kind of been hinting at that for the last couple of videos at least. So I'm not really sure how we're supposed to take this next bit as a surprise. Oh. Immediately before we get to listen to the rift. Nice. And that ended him. Where did his body go? And if I do this, this uh, sabotage, all their patents, all of them, is to think. Now, why does the prophet want? These two killed. For the same reason Lady Comstock lies buried. Child. And why does he want me to do it? Because only you can make it seem an accident. I don't think that's the real Lady Comstock. I think she's... I think she's a combination of herself and my feelings towards her. What do you mean? I'm just so angry. At her and at my father. I think she's her, but she's also partly me. I'm not even sure I understand it myself. There she is, raising more of the dead. Damn it all. Nailed her right out of the middle of the air. All right, lady, I'm coming for you. Don't you worry. Where did she go? Oh, back down there. Well, I can handle that too. Ah, crap. Taking a lot of hits here. Seems like I'm taking damage just by being anywhere near her. Man, she's raising a lot of the dead now. As long as I can get near her, get her that double damage boost. Just take her out. real thing you gotta remember about siren fights is that everybody else around her is only alive because she is. If you can nail her, it all ends. health stuff behind. Didn't raid these, though. Apparently. Alright, 
going? Well, she's only going in one direction this time. Or she's only going to one location. I guess she's taking every direction possible to get there. But yeah, anyway, I got up to, like, 2,700. Let's buy a whole bunch of this stuff. Nice. So what do I want? I want Bronco. Undertow can suck it. Don't have that much left to buy now, though. I think this is the faster route of the two. In any case, I am glad to see that Sniper Alley is still dead. Would have been awfully inconvenient if it weren't. But yeah, so, uh... Fink killed the Lutesses by sabotaging their equipment. Think you can crack this one open? Hmm. And in exchange, he got all of their patents. Done. You can understand that was one hell of a bribe, all things considered. But you two are dead. I took your funeral photo. Yes, and made an absolute hash of it. One doesn't expect a picture of one's cause. To come across so lifelessly. That's insanity. What proof would you have that Mr. Fink would hurt the Lutesses? The Lutesses told me. The Lutesses? When? Yesterday. Yesterday morning. Rupert! They've been dead these seven days. And he took their funeral photo. So I think he would know that. Kind of weird that it... I, I guess it killed them in a lot of realities, but it, in one, it just unstuck them from all realities. Trying to wrap my mind around that. All right, now I killed Lady Comstock. Tessus. And anyone who knew the truth was better dead than alive. Just so. No, you are not. Unless you listen to me. What you've been through. Ain't nobody in the world deserves that. Damn it all. Assholes on the rooftops. At least I didn't get transported very far. Open it. On it! Well, now that I think about it, I don't even need to do anything here. So why the hell am I sticking around just to deal with these hailfire assholes? I mean, seriously, look at all this. Nice. You know what? Screw these assholes. I'm just... I'm going to leave them here. To do whatever it is they do. <laughs> because why the hell should I stay? This is where I need to be. Not down there, but up here. Did a whole bunch more people die here while I was away? This is not my mother. Neither are you. But he killed you both. Yes, you I know you hate me for 
not being your daughter. And I hated you for not being my mother. That's nice. So now what? Ah, here we are. Do it now! Do it. I don't know what took her a while. Damn, she packs a punch though. Yeah, it's a real danger getting up close and personal with her. Looks like the giant ass naval mines. I can use at least use them like explosives or something. God damn. saved him is more likely than a world in which she is an evil ghost spirit who exists halfway between her mind and reality. I don't think she's from that universe, though. Sad to say. Well, we spent some time in a photographer's studio there near the end, so I guess that's justification enough to visit Science Corner and discuss the history and the development of photography. Pun not intended, but also not apologized for. Capturing the soul. You're probably tired of me saying this by now, but the origins of photography date back pretty far beyond where you might think they began. And I'm not just talking about cave paintings here, I'm talking about the first time someone captured a living image on a two-dimensional field without an artist's intervention. The Camera Obscura, which literally translates to Dark Room, has been around for two full millennia. It began as nothing more complex than a shaded room or a box with a tiny pinhole at one end. Light, which enters the pinhole, can create a projection on the opposite wall which replicates the area you would see if you looked through the hole, although this projection is upside down and backwards. This curiosity led several civilizations to invent or reinvent the field of optics, and through analogy, they discovered how the human eye works. Artists could use this projection to trace out a very accurate replica of whatever's outside, and if you used mirrors, you wouldn't have to do it upside down either. Camera obscuras are also basically how you can observe eclipses safely. Meanwhile, Alchemists also knew for centuries that silver nitrate and other silver salts will turn black if exposed to energy. Although it took until the early 18th century for German physicist Johann Schulze to prove that it is light specifically and not just heat that does the trick. 
He even created an early photograph by using chalk and silver nitrate in a jar covered with text stencils so that the silver nitrate would copy the words. Fifty years later, a Swedish chemist noted that silver chloride could be fixed as either dark or light with the application of ammonia. But there were still two problems facing people who wanted to use a camera obscura to create a permanent image. First, the camera's image was too faint to significantly affect the silver compounds, and second, the fixing compounds didn't work well with every surface material. The first successful photographs made around 1826 actually used bitumen of Judea instead of silver, bitumen being a kind of asphalt tar that hardens when exposed to light. The French inventor Nicephore Niepce left the plate to cure for between eight hours to several days and then washed it off. He could then etch the plate where the hardened bitumen wasn't, leading to an engraving which didn't have any shades beyond black and white, but which was technically photorealistic. Niepce later went on to partner up with a man named Louis Daguerre, but the former man died of a stroke a few years into their association. Several years after that, Daguerre finally pulled off a success. You start with a copper plate and apply a thin layer of silver salts. After a fairly short exposure of around 10 minutes, there's already a very faint image in the silver, and you can develop it in just a few minutes more with heated mercury vapor, and then fix it with a quick salt water bath. And even though the results were hardly equal to a modern digital photograph, daguerreotypes, because the man named the process after himself, were a massive leap forward in visual reproduction. In 1839, a French politician essentially bought Daguerre's patent so that France could share this technique with the whole world as soon as possible. All except for the United Kingdom, that is, since Daguerre did take out a patent there and hang on to it. It's also worth pointing out that the first photograph of a sitting president was of William Henry Harrison in 1841, so it's fair to say that photography took off immediately. Portraits became affordable to a vastly larger number of people because you didn't need the expertise and the expense of a master painter, and the time you needed to sit still dropped from hours across several sessions down to a single session which only lasted a few minutes. If you think people are shutterbugs today, that's only because we can be. The desire to have a picture of yourself and your loved ones is kind of like the desire to read and write. The problem wasn't the motivation, it was that absence of technology that kept us from indulging ourselves. Incidentally, I'm also reasonably certain that the rise of photography has a direct link to the rise of modern art, which started in France in the 1860s with Impressionism. The next major step after daguerreotypes was the collodion process, invented in 1851. It used iodide, collodion, kind of cellulose, and silver nitrate as the photosensitive chemicals. The plate, now glass, was exposed to the camera for a few minutes, developed with pyrogallic acid, and fixed with sodium thiosulfate or else potassium cyanide. And your eyes are probably glazing over from all the chemical names, so I'll make the rest of this brief. The problem with the collodion method is that the plate needs to be wet while it's in the camera, and it must be developed immediately. So after another 20 years came the dry plate system, which could be stored ahead of time and developed whenever, which meant that companies could manufacture photo plates in factories. But then collodion came back as celluloid in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and celluloid was one of the first materials you could really call a modern plastic. Celluloid films gave photographers a much more compact negative over the old glass plates, allowing cameras to become smaller, lighter, and giving them the ability to take a lot of photos in quick succession. Celluloid was the basis of Eastman Kodak's rise to prominence as America's foremost photography company, and it led directly to the motion picture camera and all which followed. Celluloid film was also Kodak's downfall, 
because even though they were the company that invented the first digital camera way back in 1975, they were so attached to their business model of selling and developing film rolls that they fell from grace in the 2000s and filed for bankruptcy in 2012. They're out of that now, but their future still isn't looking terribly bright. Bringing the still to life. The human eyeball and the visual cortex are kind of a weird machine, and we're not completely certain how they work even today. It's possible to identify an image you see for nothing more than one two hundredth of a second. But by flipping through just a dozen static images per second, it becomes possible to fool the eye into seeing a moving image when there's really just a series of still ones. It's called the persistence of vision, and it's basically the result of our brains cheating and reading animation where there isn't any. The first inventions to take advantage of this optical illusion were the phenakistoscope and the zoetrope, both invented independently in the 1830s. The phenakistoscope held a wheel of images, but you could only see one at a time, while the zoetrope was a cylinder with a series of slits and an equal number of images inside the drum. In both cases, the persistence of vision meant that you would see a looping animation while the wheel was in motion. Praxinoscopes later replaced zoetropes in 1877, and they used mirrors to project the rotating images onto a single spot, with the mirror's motion causing it to appear to move even between separate images. Flipbooks, oddly enough, only came about in the 1860s despite being a very simple invention, but they did lead to mechanized flipbooks, the immediate precursors to motion pictures. The Mutoscope, patented in 1894, was a crank-powered flipbook which let you look in a hooded viewing area to watch the picture move. At the same time, Edison inventor William Dixon developed the Kinetoscope, the device you actively use a couple dozen times throughout Bioshock Infinite. Well, technically they are kinetophones, because they also use a phonograph to play sound. But the big thing about kinetoscopes is that they used celluloid film to project images at your eyes, the first time that anyone had ever really done that. However, the original kinetoscope basically died soon after it was invented. The Mutoscope was a lot cheaper to produce and maintain, so they took over the Penny Arcades and the Nickelodeons, and at the higher end people were already switching to projection devices instead of hooded viewing boxes. In 1896, Edison bought the patent for a projector and positioned himself as its inventor. In 1903, Edison's company produced The Great Train Robbery, a 10-minute film considered a milestone of early cinema thanks to its length, which was considerable at the time, its pioneering editing techniques, and the fact that it's basically the first action western film ever created. The next big film wouldn't show up until 10 years later, that being Birth of a Nation. And everything after that? Well, that's Hollywood history. Personal thoughts. It's funny, you know? I keep trying to think of something interesting to say here. A point or an argument to make during this segment that people don't usually think about. But what can I say that I haven't said already? We live in a world of moving pictures. We watch movies that blur the line between fact and fiction. We watch documentaries and YouTube videos that do the same. One of the defining features of every modern house is the size of the TV set, the quality of its picture, and the number of speakers. But so what? I've said before that the heart of the human is not in facts, but in stories. And so we value stories over the truth. We live in a world of connectivity. I can chat live with someone face to face who lives on the other side of the planet. I can drop this video onto a server I've never seen, and people across the world can access it whenever they want. So what? We act to shrink the other, shrink the sense that someone else is fundamentally different from me. To spread our stories, and to understand the stories of others. 
But so what? I could tell you the truth, my truth, until I grow hoarse. I could compile images that support my ideas and my beliefs until my hands cramp up. But no matter how hard I shout or how many videos I put up, I don't get to decide whether or not I'm wasting my time. It's you. It's all up to you. You're the one who has to take the information I provide and either change or not change. It's your life. It's up to you to act or to refuse to act. So if I could ask you to do only one thing, it would be to watch and to listen. To laugh during a good comedy and cry during a good tragedy. Whether it's true or whether it's false. Because if humanity is going to succeed at this whole ruling the world thing, then all of us need to understand even those of us who don't want to understand any of us. Thanks for joining me again in Science Corner, and I hope I'll see you soon.